Hello. My name is Mitchell Mullen, and I'm stationed here in Murfreesboro in Port and Rutherford County. Our office, the Rutherford County yeah, Extension Office, is in the front office building up here, including the Lane Air Park. So if you ever have any reason to come and, and use the services of the Extension Office, go into Suite 101. Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. That's where the agents uh, are located. So you can come in there and you can get information about a variety of things. Today, we're focusing on this topic, organic pest control, the lawns and landscapes. Now, let me say right up front, I want to give a thank you to David Cook. David Cook is an uh, extension agent in Davidson County, and he put a presentation together a few years ago, and he allowed me to do some of this adapted for the presentation here today, so I appreciate David allowing me to do this. Now, any, any kind of credit, we we'll see brand name stuff listed here today. The use of a brand name is not a promotion of, nor a condemnation of that particular product. Okay, it's just there for the sake of illustration. Also, this is not an inclusive guide. Right. It's not an all-inclusive guide. There are lots and lots of possibilities out there in this world. Uh, and we're going to point out a few of those. Okay? Point out a few of those. Now, I asked this question, what is organic? So, and, I, and, I, and, and that is not a rhetorical question. All right? My, my goal is to get some input from you. What do you think organic is? What does that term mean to you? Organic. Anybody? You typically have a comment, so what is organic? <laughs> organic is just a, a natural, uh, a natural substance that you can use on your plant that uh, is healthy. That, that is healthy. <laughs> yeah, like grinding up the garlic or something and putting it out. Okay. Or not, not having this to your health. Not having this to your health. <laughs> yes. Okay. Or, I agree with it that organic is, is natural. It's not synthetically manufactured. Oh. But a lot of the organics can be extremely hazardous. Yeah, and that's, that's a very good point. And we're going to point that out here just because it's organic. You know, so, so what is organic? Yeah, and I think that, that most people have some, they, their idea is somewhat similar to what you see. Oh, okay. Okay, it comes in. So, so anything organic is, is, is based on, on uh, or is naturally derived. It's not synthesized in effect, not synthesized in a lab. Although, if you buy an organic product that's mass produced, it's synthesized in a factory. Okay, it's not synthesized, but it's manufactured. Okay, but anyway, what is organic? Uh, I want to say, I just want to make a couple comments up front. It has, it has become commonplace for proponents, proponents, those who propose and, and who promote the use of organic practices over all others. To, to refer to organic methods with statements such as, without using toxic pesticides and or harsh synthetic fertilizers. Okay, that's, that's a very common. Yes? How do you get luminary uh, in the backyard to get all the mushrooms? I'm sorry, what? Mushrooms. That, 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 that. What, what about? How do you get rid of them without using something? You probably won't. Um. <laughs> Yeah, you probably won't. I'm mean, going well, to run over, run, run over with a lot. Okay, why is the mushroom there? I don't know. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you why it's there. Because it's growing out of some organic matter in the ground. Um, okay, it could be dead tree roots. It could be some form of cellulose that's decomposing. And as long as that is there and decomposing, that's the fruiting body of that decay organism. Uh, until you get rid of that or until that has decomposed, I mean, you can kill a mushroom every day, and they're more going to grow back. And it doesn't matter if you use synthetic stuff on it or not. Unless you get down there where it is, you haven't done anything. So, time will take care of it. Okay? When it dries up, they'll, they'll stop coming out because they've got to have moisture. Um, now, that's not a really accurate statement. Okay, where it says, without using toxic pesticides for heart synthetic fertilizer. That's not an accurate statement. It doesn't matter what the pesticide is. If it is not toxic to the pest, it is of no value. What good is a non-toxic pesticide? <laughs> because it's got to control the pest and it'll be toxic. Okay, now, there are varying degrees of toxicity, different uh, uh, residual effects from, from products, but well, that's, that's, beside the, that, that's beside the point of view. 
Now, if you're going to be truly organic, that organic is a system. All right, it's a system, and a big part of that system is is building the soil, building soil health, and, and focusing on plant vigor. Okay, the, the idea behind building the soil is to create an environment for good, strong plant growth. Uh, plant growth, okay, plant vigor relates back to soil health, soil nutrition, etc. So, being organic does not preclude the use of hybrid plants to minimize the need for pesticides. Okay? Some plants are more resistant to pests than others. So if one wants to reduce the use of pesticides of any sort, then use a plant that is resistant to disease. For example, see your apple rust. How many people like golden delicious apples? Okay. Now, if you want to grow golden delicious apples in, in this area, there are lots of cedar trees here. Golden delicious apples are very susceptible to cedar apple buds. It's, it, it, is, it is an example, I think, almost of insanity to think that you're going to grow golden delicious apples without them being exposed to cedar apple buds because there's so many cedar trees here. The host of that, the first host of that disease site. Now, empire apples, Arkansas black apples, are highly resistant to cedar apple rust. So if you wanted to grow apples without as much concern of cedar apple rust and having control of cedar apple rust, then you grow an apple that is more resistant to it. The same thing is true for tomatoes that are more resistant to early blight versus tomatoes that are not resistant. Heirloom tomatoes typically have less resistance to disease. Okay? That doesn't mean they can't be grown organic. It doesn't mean that at all. All right? So that's just some, some things to get started here with. Things to keep in mind. Now, ask this question: Is this factor of myth? Organic pesticides are always safe to use and can be used in these situations. Yeah. Both of you say factor of myth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I believe you're right. Just because it's thought to be organic, said to be organic, does not mean it's not toxic. Okay. If if, 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 a, if any kind of a pest control product is not toxic to the pest, it's of no value as a pest control. All right. If you use, uh, you can use a. a Let's say you use so, uh, pyrethroid insecticide, very common insecticide sold today, you kill Japanese bees. Okay, so you kill Japanese bees with pyrethroid insecticide. Now, this other person uses, I don't know, they use uh, spinosa to kill Japanese bees. Spinosa, you'll see what that is in a minute. Which one was toxic? As far as people are concerned, both of them are. Okay, both of them are. One is, a, is an organic product, one is not. So keep that point in mind. Uh, and actually, there are some organic products that can be that can have a greater level of toxicity, higher degree of toxicity, than some synthetic. Nicotine, for example. Nicotine is a plant-derived uh, insecticide. Okay, it can be an insecticide. It, it can be a plant-derived poison. If you would. All right, much more toxic in pure form than, than lots of other things, synthetic things. Are. So just something to keep in mind. Fact for me. You get better control with an organic product than you do with a conventional product. Well, what do you think? Fact is, myth. is it a fact? Is a myth? Well, not usually better. All right. Typically, you're not going to get better control with an organic product. You may have equal control, but typically, it's not going to be better. What about the statement that organic pesticides are cheaper? Right. <laughs> yeah. Usually, they're more expensive. Usually, they are more expensive. Prime example of that um, is uh, uh, you know crabgrass preventer, pre-emergent herbicide. A synthetic crab dimension is one. A fertilizer with dimension product costs you maybe a dollar and change per thousand square feet of tree. Another organic option is uh, uh, an, an organic option to, to, to try to do the same thing is to use corn gluten. Corn gluten meal, in order to be effective, has to be applied at the rate of about 20 pounds per thousand square feet. Whereas with you know a synthetic product, you're looking at like a pound uh, and change per thousand square feet. It costs roughly thirty dollars per thousand feet to use that much corn gluten meal versus a dollar and change per thousand feet. So typically they're more expensive. That's just one example. Okay. Now I'm not proposing that people use organic practices. I'm not opposing to use organic practices. I'm just providing some information. Now. Why choose organic? A lot of different reasons, okay? 
for every person in this room, if you chose to use organic products, you could choose organic practices, your reason may be different than anybody else's. So there's bound to be a lot of different reasons for doing that. It can be your attitude about using pesticides. All right. Well, because you know, is, are there are there ever any pesticide residues in food products? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. No question about that. Um, are there? Uh, you maybe you have an attitude about using uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers. That might be a reason you want to go with with the organic route. That's all fine and good too. It doesn't matter why you choose it. Just choose it because it's something that you decide to do, not because something that I told you, not because. Uh, so, some group out here says you ought to do it. You know, you think about it. You make the choice be based on the decision making process that you've gone through. Think for yourself just a little bit, okay? Question some things and, and do a little research and, 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 and then make a decision. Then make a decision. So, as I said, if you're going to be involved in organic, if you're, if you're going to do it, if you're going to follow true organic practices, then you're going to follow the system, the organic system. And part of that, the key to that is soil building. Okay? Building and improving the quality of the soil. Typically, the, the biggest component of that is the use of uh, organic matter. Adding organic matter, increasing organic matter content in the soil to improve soil tilt, to improve soil micro populations, just to improve air holding capacity, water holding capacity. Now, improving soil by the adding organic matter, why is it, if, let's say, you know, in a, in a perfect, you know, not a perfect soil, in an ideal soil today, a native soil, the state of Tennessee, if you could have someone in the neighborhood, uh, a percent, percent and a half, two percent organic matter, that'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty good, okay? Now, typically, you know, our native soils are gonna be less than a percent. Less than a percent of organic matter, okay? Now, or see, less than two percent, excuse me. Less than two percent. So, if let's say we get it up to three percent, four percent, why, 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 why doesn't it stay there? Because you're working on it. Well, because you're working on it, because something else working, because something else working on it, and that something else is the weather. Right? No. Well, I mean, what, it's all everything's tied together. But, but. One of, the, one of the benefits, and it's, 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 I, I stated right up here, promoting soil biological activity, what does that mean? We have more microbes, more fungi, more bacteria that feed on organic matter. Those populations increase when you increase organic matter content in the soil. So you've got a better buffet line. You know, when you have good meal, you typically draw bigger crack. And then what happens when all the food goes? Everybody leaves, okay? Well, these things are eating the food. They're eating organic matter. That's why, that's why you can't get the soil to a level and say, poof, I'm through. Because if you want to maintain that, you've got to keep adding to it. Okay, because these critters, that's their food source. That's their food source. So those microbes, those fungi, those bacteria, they're feeding on that organic matter. Okay. So you don't ever stop. It's an ongoing process. Now, what are some of the benefits of organic matter? Well, you know, you've got essential nutrients. Every every plant, every piece of plant has got some small quantity of nutrients that are essential to plants. And there are 19 nutrients that are essential to plants. I say that every plant will have some of all those. That may not necessarily be true. Like all of them will not, all, all plant residue will not have oxygen in it. That's going to come from the atmosphere. But there are probably 16 of those essential nutrients that can be found in remnants or, or, or plant residue, animal residue, like when you're at Okay, so yeah, there is some nutrient value to that. But even better than that, though, is what it does to improve structure of soil. You know, soil, you got, you got solid particles, and then you've got space. The solid particles are made up of sand, silt, and clay. That's the mineral part of it. And then you've got the worms, and you've got the bugs. Okay, that's, that's the, the living solid part of the soil. Now, where does air and water reside in this soil? It resides in the spaces between the solid particles. These brown blobs represent solid particles of the soil. The blue spots and the white spots in between represent pore spaces. It's in those pore spaces where the water's going to be and where the air is going to be. Also, think about plant roots. Do plant roots grow in soil or do they grow through soil? They grow through soil. And so the more pore space you have, the better tilt 
okay, or ease of rooting, ease of tillage, ease of water moving, ease of air moving, the better the tillage is. And that's what organic matter does. It helps to increase pore space, okay, or that's one thing that it helps to increase pore space. And so, increasing pore space, improves soil drainage, it improves air infiltration, uh, it's good stuff, okay? It also improves the available water holding capacity of soil. Clay soil, if you have a high clay content, will it hold a lot of water? Yes, it will. It sure will. That's why plants planted in a really high clay content soil, they drain. Because the water holds, it doesn't drain out because the, the, the clay part was so tiny, there's not enough pore space and it's slow to drain out. Okay? So you add organic matter to it, you have bigger pore spaces, and you have better percolation, better infiltration, exfiltration, depending on what you're talking about coming in or going out. So it helps. It helps in lots of ways. Organic matter is good. If you don't remember anything else, organic matter is good stuff. It's good. So take home some today. Now, when it comes to lawn care, if, if you want to improve, if you want to improve the amount of organic matter in the soil, you can do it that tearing up the yard. How do you do that? Okay. A way to do that is through a process called top dressing. And that is where you core aerate the lawn, and you know a core aerator punches lots of holes in the ground. It punches, it pulls out, flows the soil, leaves a hole in the ground, deposits flows on top of the ground. Then you take compost and you spread it over the soil, over the surface. And then once it's spread, and you you can do this by hand. It's a great family activity. It's a great family activity. It's good fun, good exercise. Give the kids something to do. Um, and then once you get it all spread out out of the piles, you rake it in those aeration holes. Okay, that is a that is a, a feasible way to add organic matter to an existing turf without destroying the existing turf. Okay? Now, there are tools that will have to do that. It makes it easier. But the process is the same. We use the tools, we do it by hand. That is a way to increase organic matter in existing lawn areas. If you've got a lawn, if you've got a spot in your lawn that just, it just won't grow grass for whatever reason, and if you have determined that there is not an obstruction down there, that you have soil depth, okay, you can test that by taking a rod or something and driving it in the ground. If you can't drive it down more than six inches or so, you probably don't have enough soil there to grow grass anyway. But if you can penetrate that down there to the depth greater than six inches, and you just won't, it just won't grow very well there, try taking that area, adding compost in there, working the improving organic matter content. You may see a big improvement in that spot in the yard. Now, when it comes in, and no, I'll just make this clear: about using compost, top dressing, it takes a lot of material. Okay, this this chart shows you how much a yard of compost will cover, and a yard is three feet by three feet by three feet. That's a cubic yard. That's 27 cubic feet of material. If you want to spread a layer a quarter inch deep over a thousand feet, or excuse me, if you want to use a yard of compost, it'll cover almost 1,300 feet. That's a quarter inch deep, that's 1,300 square feet. If you spread a half inch thick layer, it'll only cover 645 square feet. So on a 10,000 square foot yard, you know, a half inch of compost, that's a lot of stuff, okay? That's a lot of stuff. But you know what? You take that task on, you got something to do every day. You don't have to do it all in one day, so you already got a job. When you go home from work, you know, or whatnot, you want to relax, go out and spread compost, top dress the yard. It takes a while to get it all done. Now, if you're building a flower bed, if you're building a vegetable bed, okay, a lot easier task. You can add lots of organic matter into that space while you're building that bed. All right? It's much easier to do. Organic matter can be added during the construction, and then you can add to it as time goes by. So, now, let's talk about pest control, okay? Talk about pest control. What are pests? Insects are pests, yes. okay? Some people are pests, but we're not talking about control people, all right? Uh, diseases are pests. Plant diseases are pests. In, uh, weeds are pests. Anything that takes away from the productive potential of a crop is a pest. So, insects do that, diseases do that, weeds. They compete for the same nutrients, the same space, same sunlight, the same large plants. So all these things can interfere with the productive potential of those plants. So from an insect control standpoint, we're going to talk about those things first. You know, there are a lot of predatory insects out there that prey on pest insects. So if you're going to be uh, successful in using an organic approach to pest control, you want to take advantage of those uh, in beneficials, the beneficial insects. And, and you know, Things to keep in mind, though. If you want to create an environment for, you've got to create an environment for them. Because they need food, they need water, they need shelter. 
as the year progresses, as the seasons progress, you know, their, their diet will change, so you've got to account for that. Uh, they will use some of the same food sources as the, uh, uh, as the pest insects do, okay? Uh, many of the beneficial insects are small. So you want to plant plants that produce small flowers that are open. It makes it easy for them to get in there and feed on nectar and feed on honey, uh, uh, the uh, pollen and so on. It's good to have a, a variety of bloom time in these plants so that they start blooming early and bloom throughout the season so you can have blooms year round. You typically will have a better chance of having populations of beneficial insects if you do that because there's food, there, there's, there's nectar, there's pollen sources out there uh, throughout the year that way. Now these are all examples of beneficial insects, okay? You probably recognize some of those. Some of them you may not recognize. You may not recognize, you may not recognize, and you may not be familiar with what they do for you. So we'll talk about a few of these things. Uh, first one, you know, everybody's familiar with lady bugs. Yes. Okay, the lady bees. Everybody's familiar with those. The, the, the adults over there, that's the larva. Kind of ugly looking thing. People see that, well that must be a pest. No, it's not. It's going to grow in one of these lady bees over here. Look at it, what's it doing? It's eating aphids. The, the young probably eat more aphids than do the adults on these lady bees. But they're really good predators on lady bees. They, they prey on, on aphids. They don't prey on themselves, they say they prey on lady beetles. Lady beetles prey on aphids, they prey on mealy bugs, mites, soft scale, and insect eggs. A typically soft body pest is what these things will feed on. Okay? That's what they'll feed on. So, just because you see something like this, this point of work good on the screen. Now, does anybody think that looks like something you want to pet on? No, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. But it can do a good job. Okay? So, so sometimes it's important to know what a critter is before you start doing something about it. You don't want to do anything about this necessarily. Now, I will say this. I grew up into adults. How many of you ever had ladybugs come in your house in the wintertime? In the fall? I, you know, it's the same good lady. Okay, now these are introduced ladybugs. They're roughly 5,500 species of ladybugs across the world. All of them have those same characteristics. These are Asian lady beetles, multicolored Asian lady beetles. They were introduced in the United States some years ago. No, we didn't do it. So don't post, post it up. We didn't do it. Uh, they're the ones that are coming into your house in the fall of the year. Are they going to hurt the house? No. Will they aggravate you? Yes. Oh. Yes. Aggravate you considered? Yes. Well, to be honest, ladybugs are one of my favorite insects, and I also like monarch butterflies. Well, you pick two good ones. Pick two good ones. So, ladybugs can be good choices. They can prey on lots of other. Now, lace wings. Lace wings. Here's a little lace wing. Mm -hmm. Here's a larva lace wing. That's not very pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay, not very pretty. Have, have any of you ever seen uh, this? This is grass blade, and, and you've got these little eggs, or these little objects, little football shaped things, attached by fine filaments from that leaf blade. Well, those are lace wing eggs. Okay. That's the latest egg out there, and then those things will hatch into these, and they'll crawl around. They're kind of like the, the, the ladybugs. They feed on the soft bodied insects. Okay. Aphids, thrips, little caterpillars, things like that. They do. Not very pretty. Not very pretty. And, and, you know, these are not as recognizable as the lady beetle larva because they're not as distinctive colored. The lady beetle's got the orange and the red or the orange and the black, uh, uh, or the black and the orange and the black and the red coloration on it. This one is more of a dull color. But the adult lace wing, she's called lace wing because of this, or he, or she, there's another team. That nice, large, lacy wing. The wing is larger than, than, than she is. It's longer than the body. It's much wider than the body. Uh, those are good. Okay, those are good. Hoverflies. These little yellow and black little bee-looking flies, which are not bees, they're not going to sting, they're not going to bite you, but they are. And here's a larva, okay, of this hoverfly. They eat critters. Wow. The same kinds of things. So those, those, those aphids and spider mites, they'll feed on those. They do. Plus, they can pollinate things, too. I mean, all, pollen, all pollination is is moving pollen from one flower to another, okay, or moving it from the stamen of the thistle in the same flower. That's all pollination is. 
if these guys feed on those flowers, they feed on one and go to another, they're going to pollinate. Okay, so a lot of these things are good pollinators as well as good uh, predator insects. And you can see what their eggs look like up here. These aren't very big. Okay, they're not very big at all. They're small. You, know, you think about the sweat bees, things like that. They're kind of in the same ballpark size-wise. Stay. It's the Kennedy fly or the Tacking fly, depending on where you're from, how you say it. And there's there's a lot of different species of those things. They are predators. Caterpillars, sawflies, squash bugs, stink bugs, and grasshoppers. Now, warfare is not pretty. Okay, so so some of the things that these predator insects do to their prey insects is not very pretty. Uh, but here is how these parasitic flies and wasps, and so here's what they do. They lay eggs on the host insect. You can see on this plant, this stink bug up here, all, all stink bug is a kind of plant bug, all right? You can see the little white eggs up there. On this one down at the bottom, you see the white eggs. On this caterpillar, you see the white eggs. What are they gonna do? So, so the eggs, they're gonna, they're gonna grow and develop. <clears throat> Sometimes they hatch into mm -hmm. this thing. And, and, and they, they just destroy from the inside out. So, so you know, these are parasitic on the pest. All right, so they're parasitic. They, they draw their food and, and what they need to live from the pest. There is one, I think I have a picture of it. I'll show the eggs later. Okay, here are parasitic wasps. They are, see it parasitized, here's an aphid. Here it is, he's stinging this caterpillar over here. Typically, you're talking about those soft bodied insects uh, as well as the plant bugs. And the plant bugs, again, has things like the, the, the stink bug, etc. All right? There's what parasitized aphid looks like, a normal aphid. Now, there's one of these flies, a, a tacketed fly, it is a, a predator on fire ants. And it's the coolest thing the way it works. They'll hover around fire ant mounds, and the fire ants, they'll, they'll catch one. They don't, they don't hurt them. Right then, they don't hurt them. But they lay an egg back here uh, in this thorax here. When that egg hatches, it pops the fire ant's head off. Oh, it can't take it cool. So, warfare is not always pretty, even in the insect world. But these things can do. They can. They can eat a lot. Of, a lot of. Uh, a lot of beneficial. The beneficial can eat a lot of parasites. A lot of predators. Okay. Now, the thing about it is, to have good populations of, of those, you've got to have food sources for them. So you want to plant things that are going to provide nectar, provide uh, pollen, etc. For them to eat. These are some examples. Okay. Aster, carrot, and buckwheat family flowers are really useful because they typically have those smaller flowers and they'll bloom throughout the summer. They have long bloom cycles. They fit in that pretty good. Uh, sweet alyssum is one. You sow it early in the year. It germinates really fast. Uh, it can tolerate drought and heat pretty well once it gets started. It's got a small flower, lots of flowers, and, and many insects can find food sources on there. They use it as a food source. That's a pretty good one. Bachelor's buds, corn flowers. Lots of good pollen, lots of good nectar. And the thing about it is, even if the plant's not blooming on these, the leaves release a little nectar. So it can be a nectar source for some of those insects, even if they don't have a lot of flower blooms out there. So it can be a good source. And you know, these are, uh, these are warm weather flowers. So they're growing throughout the heat, throughout the summertime. Uh, cosmos, you know, come in the right and cold. Uh, they'll attract good pollinating insects, as well as some of those hover flies, Lace wings and some of the other parasitic insects we didn't mention up here. Okay. Coreopsis, you get a variety of colors. Uh, they have a long bloom cycle, they're low maintenance, and they're very wide open blooms like all of these are. So there's a lot of little insects, they don't have to have a long feeding tube to reach in there to get right into it uh, and get to, get to the food source. Cat mint, that's going to be a perennial lavender blue colored flower. Butterflies, other insects, uh, it's attractive to those. It can grow wide, so you need some space for that. Drought tolerant once it gets established, so it's a, it's a good plant uh, to use uh, here in our area. 
sunflowers, you know, perennial sunflowers, you got annual sunflowers, you have perennial sunflowers. The perennial sunflowers come back here every year. They don't have to be huge, okay? Some of these are not gonna have that huge head. You don't really want that huge head because you produce all that seed and, and not as much uh, not as much nectar, not as much pollen, well, produce a lot of pollen, not as much nectar. So you like these smaller flowers, these wide open flowers like that, for those guys to get in there. And they're gonna bloom during the latter part of the summertime, that late summer or fall time frame when some other things may be on the way out. So that's a good, uh, food source plant to put in there to attract some of the beneficial insects as well. Okay, so we talked about using some beneficial insects and some things that you can do. And, and there are, if you do any kind of uh, Google search for uh, uh, attracting beneficials or attracting pollinators, there's some good references out there. Michigan State University has a really good publication on attracting uh, plantings for pollinator insects. What's in Michigan? What good does that do us? Look at some of the plant leaves. 